Hello. In this video, I will discuss the basic areas of finance and the roles financial professionals in each of these areas play. Finance is the study of money management. In finance, we build return prediction models, examine how money flows to and from investors, and identify how firms and investors manage money. Every other area of business relates to finance, since one of the roles of financial professionals in a firm is to determine the appropriate allocation of money to various projects, as well as other investments and accounts. Understanding finance allows an individual who is majoring in another discipline to effectively understand why certain decisions are made by their organizations. This is the same reason why everyone is required to take marketing courses, management courses, and other courses in uh, other disciplines. Most companies want to see a cost-benefit analysis for an increasing number of decisions in all areas of the firm. This is why business students need to be able to use financial principles even if they are not part of the finance area of the firm. At a personal level, they will be making financial decisions for both themselves and their families for the rest of their lives. Now, there are several financial principles I want to immediately state because of their extreme importance to the discipline. First, more of an asset is almost universally seen as better than less of an asset, since assets offer investors some positive utility. Second, the sooner cash is received, the better. The saying, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, is somewhat appropriate in our field, since once you receive cash, there's no uncertainty about when you're going to be paid. Finally, less risky assets are preferable to riskier assets. When I say risk in this course, I'm referring to the volatility of an asset's return. A return is the percentage change in an asset's price. When return volatility is high, investors are more hesitant to purchase the asset without some additional compensation, such as a higher expected return. There are arguably four main subfields of finance, although this breakdown can vary depending upon who you ask. Investments refers to to the decisions of businesses, institutions, governments, and individuals about which securities to buy or sell. Investment professionals often perform valuation or spend their time managing portfolios of securities like stocks and bonds. Managerial, or corporate finance, refers to the decisions made by employees of a company about how to manage cash flows. These decisions include, but are not limited to, dividend policy, capital budgeting, inventory management, and financial policy. A financial market is a market in which people trade financial securities and derivatives, such as futures, options, stocks, and bonds. The stock exchanges you have undoubtedly heard of, like the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, are examples of financial markets which allow investors to trade stocks and bonds. Finally, financial services are the economic services provided by the finance industry, which includes commercial banks, savings banks, credit unions, credit card companies, insurance companies, financial planners, and brokers. Many people think of financial services as primarily banking and insurance, but the industry is much broader than that. Let's talk about each of these areas in a bit more detail. As I just mentioned, investments focuses on valuation and asset allocation. Investment professionals must decide whether to add a certain asset to their portfolios based upon whether the asset meets the portfolio's objectives, offers an appropriate expected return relative to its level of risk, and helps create diversity in the portfolio. There are two types of assets we refer to in investments, real and financial assets. The value of real assets is tied directly to the benefit that that asset has for you or me. The value of financial assets is dependent upon underlying real assets. Examples of financial assets are stocks and bonds whose value is derived from the underlying assets of the firm or the government that issued that, that stock or that bond. Asset allocation is a term often used in finance, and it refers to the strategy of building a diversified portfolio of assets to ensure that when the value of one asset or asset class falls, the value of the other assets in the portfolio do not. This is the fundamental idea behind portfolio diversification. Now, Investment professionals who are able to construct portfolios that offer them or their firm or their clients high returns or returns that beat expectations can often make a large amount of money through commissions, bonus, or their salary. The investment industry involves a number of different roles. 
Brokers buy and sell assets on behalf of their client. Financial advisors make recommendations for their clients to follow in order to achieve their financial goals. Portfolio managers obviously manage the portfolios of their clients and try to be a benchmark. Security analysts value securities and collect information about the securities for the, uh, for the organization that employs them. Actuaries, particularly pension actuaries, attempt to ensure a pension fund is able to pay out exactly the amount owed to individuals who have money in the pension fund. Investment bankers have a number of roles, but historically they help companies and governments sell new financial assets to the public for the first time and also help oversee mergers. Financial services firms, or financial institutions as I said earlier, are companies that specialize in financial matters and help organizations and individuals manage their money. The most prominent examples of financial institutions, which is, by the way, the term I will use throughout the course, are banks, insurance companies, and brokerage firms. It is important, important to note that as a result of the Great Depression, financial institutions were not allowed to provide banking, brokerage, and ins insurance services to their clients altogether. The U.S. federal government mandated that these services be provided by separate institutions. As a result of several relatively recent pieces of deregulation in the 1990s, like the Regal Neal Act of 1994 and the Financial Services Modernization Act of 1999, banks were allowed to operate across state lines and offer brokerage services to their clients. This deregulation has allowed the banking industry consolidate and was arguably the greatest contributing factor to the 2008 financial crisis since many banks became too big for the federal government to let fail without setting off a complete collapse of the financial market. An example of a large financial institution is Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs' total assets are currently $968 billion, which just happens to be larger than the GDP of all but the top 15 countries in the world. This firm is technically a commercial bank, but it also underwrites, or sells, new securities. The firm also lends money to firms and governments around the world. To put the scale of Goldman Sachs in perspective, at the time I'm recording this video, as I said, Goldman Sachs has about $968 billion in total assets. That's almost five times larger than the GDP of the country of Greece. An even more amazing fact is that Goldman Sachs isn't even the largest U.S. bank. J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo are all larger than Goldman Sachs. Managerial finance is just another name for corporate finance. Students often get confused by the terminology, especially when different terms are used to refer to the same thing. In the real world, most people tend to say corporate finance. Now, corporate finance refers to the financial decisions which are made by individual firms. Financial managers have to decide how a firm will manage its cash. They have to determine what long-term investments the firm will make, how the firm will raise capital, or cash, to, fin to finance their operations, and how the firm will manage its cash on a daily basis to avoid a stock out or having unsold inventory sitting in a warehouse. When someone is in corporate finance, they're often referred to as financial manager. The top financial manager in a business is often financial officer, or CFO for short. The CFO can also be the president or the vice president of the company. Regardless of their actual title, the CFO has two primary roles. First, they must act as the firm's treasurer, ensuring that the firm has enough cash on hand for daily expenses and operations. Second, the CFO must operate the firm's accounting function. They are responsible for paying the firm's tax. The CFO, or VP of Finance role, is usually filled by someone with both an accounting and finance background, because the position has responsibility for both the controller and the treasury functions in a firm. Often, the CFO will be a CPA, or Certified Public Accountant. The Chief Financial Officer is overseen by either the, the COO, or Chief Operating of, Operations Officer, or the, C, the CEO, or Chief Executive Officer. The CEO of a publicly traded firm is overseen by the board of directors who are elected by the shareholders of the firm. As I said a few seconds ago, financial managers have several different roles in a firm. First, financial managers must determine which capital budgeting projects would likely be profitable for a firm. 
they are also responsible for managing the firm's capital structure. Capital structure refers to the method the firm uses to raise cash for operations. Firms with too much debt relative to equity are more likely to default on that debt, but there are several advantages, like the reduction in a firm's tax liability, to being highly levered. Finally, most financial managers spend their days ensuring that the firm has enough cash on hand to pay suppliers and ensure they receive cash they are owed by customers in a timely fashion. This activity is called working capital management. Several major decisions financial managers must occasionally make involve the firm's payout policy, merger activity, and IPO. Payout policy refers to the firm's policy on returning cash to shareholders, either in the form of a dividend or a stock repurchase. Profitable firms like Apple or Ford often initiate dividends to compensate shareholders for purchasing shares. Many dividend-paying firms do not have a good investment opportunity for that cash, so it's best to simply return it to shareholders. Many of the largest firms in the world will also, will also often engage in M&A operations, or mergers and acquisitions. Mergers and acquisitions both refer to a case where one firm combines its operations with another firm, although an acquisition generally refers to a case where one of those firms is significantly larger than the target firm, aka the firm it's acquiring. A merger is generally viewed as a combination of equals or very close to equals, so firms of similar size. Finally, some firms choose to undertake an IPO. An IPO, or Initial Public Offering, occurs when a firm's board and management determine the, firm, determine the firm should begin selling its shares to the general public. There are many reasons for listing shares on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ or another public exchange. Once a firm completes an IPO and is listed, investors like you and I can buy those shares for whatever another investor is willing to sell them for. So now we've talked about the basic roles of financial professionals. In the next video, we'll discuss the forms that firms take in the United States.